The horse is a living symbol of the historic and pioneer spirit of the Wild West. And there is an emotional connection to these animals. Our two species, human and equine, possess a unique relationship. While some special interest groups attempt to complicate that relationship, the truth remains very simple. Our responsibility is to provide a comfortable situation for domestic and feral horses from birth on to death, as we simultaneously protect Americans' ability to enjoy horses to the fullest, whether recreationally, economically, or both. We're a nation of laws not of warm, fuzzy feelings. So I think the activists should come out when these horses are starving to death. And when that horse gets to the point where it tips over and it lays there for usually over 24 hours, the ravens come by, they pick out the eye that's up, and then it takes about another 12 hours for that horse to die. Everything that is alive at some point is going to die. But do we want to starve things to death? I know I don't. I'd rather see things managed properly. The horse advocates, they haven't contributed one thing for the enhancement of that horse out there on that range. The ranchers, they have maintained the, uh, the waters, the water developments. They have salted their game. All uh, predator control has been initiated by the livestock industry. It's time to bring facts, reason, and a special perspective to an issue dominated by emotion. Congress was real clear in the Wild Horse and Burrow Act. The, the, ob the obvious and most humane way to gather the, is to gather the horses and dispose of them either as, as adoptees, adopting them to people that want to take care of them, uh, or euthanizing them. We, we really don't have, we only have two elements that are real good choices for 20 years or more, maybe even 30 years now, horses have been put in the corral or in the, in the holding areas at huge expense to the taxpayers, and it hasn't solved the problem. We still have the problem. So that, that in that nature of, of, of identifying a problem and, and then doing some monitoring to find out whether it worked or not, then there's another example of a, of a program that, that had good intentions but didn't work. The Congress knew that when they wrote the Wild Horse and Burrow Act. Congress was real clear. You, you hold the numbers down to the level that can be supported a thriving natural ecological balance, and you do it through, through either having people take the horses. If nobody will take those horses, they're to be euthanized. They're to be killed, uh, killed by whatever means are humane and, and appropriate. But the idea is, is not the, lo the, the loss of the horses that have to have to die is not the problem, it's, uh, it's the loss of the plants that support all the horses that's the problem. And so we're so right now we're sacrificing healthy plants and healthy rangelands for a large number of horses that, that sooner or later, the history tells us, are going to starve to death and have a catastrophic die off anyway. Vast suffering is occurring on the rangeland. Few sites are more tragic than malnourished or starved horses. They are scrounging for food and water. They are literally starving to death. When feed intake is decreased, the horse relies on its body stores of energy, muscle, and fat. It takes approximately 60 to 90 days of feed deprivation for a normal, healthy horse to lose its ability to remain standing. The way these animals are living is inhumane and a viable solution needs to be put into practice. This is the last water source here, and it's mud. Uh, like there's over, there's another group of horses right over waiting their turn to come in right now, and there's nothing there for them to drink. It's just all mud. And they just, uh, this spring when there was a lot of water, you could never get this close to them. You know, you could get within a half a mile of them and, and uh, they would shy away and take off, but they're 
so thirsty that they don't care about danger right now. Well, the horse will suffer because he'll, I mean, they virtually starve to death if somebody's not here to fix the water or put out supplement for them or, you know, manage the land. But there comes a point where you can't manage anymore because there's just too many. And there's, that's where we're at now. We're getting way too many Mustangs for the balance of the ecosystem that's here, so. When Mother Nature takes a harvest, it's very harsh. And uh, we don't want, you know, people don't want to see that. And I don't want to see that as a veterinarian. If, if that same situation were occurring with a privately owned horse down the road, someone would make a complaint to the county and there would be actual criminal charges brought against that person for starving a horse and not taking care of it. But yet we have literally thousands of horses that are out there at that same risk and we don't seem to have a positive move in a direction to correct that. Currently, the Bureau of Land Management estimates that there are 52,000 horses roaming freely on public land in the Western United States. Some estimates suggest that there may be as many as 100,000. Rescues and sanctuaries are full, overwhelmed, and unable to accept the volume of horses that need a place to go. And somebody that has been used to living out in the open space like this, and then you shove them in a corral somewhere where they can't lay down with some, without somebody else stepping on you, you know, that's, that's not good. That they're, they're has, they have to be eliminated. There are now 45,000 horses in holding facilities. And the BLM's horse budget has soared from $19.8 million in 2000 to $74.9 million in 2012. By the time they reach a, a, an age to die, they've cost the taxpayers $45,000 and probably more. And that, and their veterinary expenses, my gosh, it just goes on and on. And for what? Most of these people are in these horse advocate groups. They've never seen those horses in those holding facilities. They couldn't care less. It's a dream in their mind that those horses are there and aren't they wonderful. My cattle, the last of my cattle are being sold this next week. And I will be out of the cow business, uh, my saddle stock. I got rid of it last week. I can't afford to feed her. And it's, when my cattle go, it's just, uh, it's like part of my family leaving. It's really heart-wrenching. Um, if you can't feed yourself, you're no longer a world power. So if you lose the ability to feed yourself, you're no longer a thriving nation. When, you, when uh, South America says we want $1,000 for a bushel of lettuce, what are we going to do? You can't put it back into production overnight. We'll, we won't be able to feed ourselves, and then we'll be at the mercy of somebody else. You build your herd up, and you have really nice cattle that get top price wherever they go, and then you see those all heading for the butcher. It just, uh, it's mind, uh, it just tears your guts out. I, I just, uh, it's about the same feeling I had when my father died. I think it's gonna get a lot worse before it gets better. I think, uh, I think that there's gonna end up being a lot of hungry Americans before we change. I, that's my, my outlook of it. I'm not giving up the fight to protect the range. It's, uh, it's just another phase of my life. <laughs> Now these horses are all going to live their life and they're going to die one way or another. I mean, that's, that's a fact of life. And animal rights groups, uh, I kind of applaud their efforts, but they have become so arrogant thinking that they're the only ones that care about the animals when, when the ranchers really care more about animals than any of those people do. And, uh, so, but the numbers need to be managed and kept down at the appropriate levels so that the uh, BLM's model of multiple use for everything can be sustained and the range can sustain a suitable number of animals. Academics 
have sounded a warning over the rising cost of America's federally managed wild horse and burro program, saying that captive Mustangs could cost the U.S. $1 billion over the next 17 years unless changes are made. The perception that these horses are thriving in the wild, roaming free, is shockingly inaccurate. There is a very real problem with overpopulation, and thousands of horses are being abandoned to fend for themselves and starve in harsh environments on state, tribal, and private lands. The legislature just passed the law just the last session that it's against the law to feed the wild horses. And the reason for that is, you know, somebody's going to get killed one of these days. And the horses are coming into the towns and close to the populated areas, and it's just, it's just not good. There's, they're eating everything out here. They're destroying the, uh, the, uh, all of the, the resource. Wild horses and burros have virtually no natural predators. Their herd populations grow at an average rate of 20% each year, and herd sizes can double in every four years. There, I just don't understand how the, the Wild Horse and Burrow Act has got in the shape it is. Even if they would enforce the Wild Horse and Burrow Act, it is, it is written, and, and uh, and uh, keep the horses at a, uh, at a ecological balance with nature, as the wild horse law stated. But they're not. They, they are, uh, they've put them on the throne. They've overprotected them. And, uh, and they've even closed the slaughterhouses and affected all of the horse business. And, and a lot of these people are badly affected that was dependent on horses I mean, when a horse gets old, when a, a, a horse uh, loses the usefulness or there's crippled, there is no vehicle to get rid of that horse. I mean, it's even again a law to even kill that horse now. And, and I don't understand. A horse is a resource, and, and he should be handled as a resource. A humane end-of-life option for the excess equine population is a necessary part of our productive interaction with horses. I would like to see uh, the inspection for the processing plants to open back up. And then these horses in the spring, when they're in good shape, they could be hauled off and processed, sent overseas. There's a lot of starving people that would love to have them. There's people in this country that would love to have them. And there's so many people that would just cringe the thought of seeing one of these on somebody's plate for dinner. But in other, some countries, you know, you go into a meat market, the horse meat sells for a lot more money than the choice beef. So it is a commodity that should be utilized and that money used to manage the horses. The solution would be to get the slaughterhouses back in and uh, get our slaughterhouses established and treat the horse like he, is a, like he is a resource and should be treated just like a cow. I love cattle too, but I don't really ship them. And, and I had a hamburger there for lunch. The well-being of these animals should not be restricted by public policy, crafted on the basis of social or emotional argument. God put these animals, uh, you know, gave us dominion over them. We're to take care of them. We're not supposed to treat them like this. The time for action is now. To learn more, go to protecttheharvest.com.